Father God, we just ask for your presence to be here among us today. Let everything that we do and say bring honor and glory to your name. We ask this in your precious name. Amen. Please remain standing for our opening hymn, number 181. Does Jesus care? Yes, he does. And dear Father in heaven, we come to you this morning, your children. Different backgrounds, different countries, and here we all are in Canada, in your house of praise and worship. Lord, I ask that you will bless us all Forgive us for our sins, dear Lord, and no matter what, Lord, help us to live for you. We live in a very difficult world. There are so many things happening. But Lord, the scripture tells us that when we see these things happening around us, we know that you are coming soon to take us home. And we're looking forward to that day. Please, Lord, come quickly. And now we just commit this worship service into your care. Father, we pray for those of our members that are ill, that you will be with them. There are others, Father, who have special needs. You know all our needs, and we just ask that you will supply them. Most of all, we pray that you will just fill us with your spirit. Be with Jonathan, Lord, as he speaks to us this morning. 
We pray, dear Lord, that whatever he has to say to us will come straight from your throne of grace. Help him, dear Lord, to speak to us in a way that we can understand and will truly serve, to listen, truly trust you and be like you. We commit everything into your care now. In Jesus' name, amen. Today's offering is being collected for the North American Division Women's Ministries. And since its inception, this ministry has been developed to help the church in proclaiming the gospel to the world. And what this ministry does, it, is, it affirms all women to find an active role in reaching those in their community for Christ. So that's what this offering collected today will do, is support the Women's Ministries Department and their various ministries and things that they have specialized to help meet the specific needs of women. There are many, uh, for instance, women's Bible studies series that are for women that you can find on the website for the NAD. You will see there's the, in the section there, there's a list of resources there for women. Joy of Journey, for instance, um, Surprised by Love, featuring Elizabeth Talmud, various Bible studies that are promoted through the Women's Ministries Department. So your gift today marked NAD Women's Ministries will affirm the work of women in our church, and I'm inviting you to give generously to this ministry. Will our ushers please stand? Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity that we have to share with you and to give back to you some of what you've given to us. And I pray that you will pour out a spirit of generosity upon our hearts as we give back to you. Help us to be cheerful givers. Bless us throughout the rest of this program, and may every cent dollar that is collected be used for its intended use, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.
at this time. We have a special time here, and we have another baby dedication. And only one amen. I hope that wasn't the parents that said that. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to see a little one dedicated to the Lord. And I'm, it's just such a pleasure to actually be part of it. Um, Mehdi and Philman, I'd like to invite you up right now. Please come on up with the, with the family. And we're going to dedicate your little one to the Lord. As we all know, it's not just mother and father. It's the whole family. It's the whole family. Come on up. It's just, it's, it's such a privilege to, to be here, to see this. Come on up. Any more family? Any more family? <laughs> Technically, we all should be up here because we're all together. It takes a village to raise a child, doesn't it? So, you know, it's, it's been such a pleasure to see you here. Um, even though you are, you're in Edmonton, you know, she chose to, to come back just to have me dedicate her. No, she didn't, but um, she just calls us home, and it's, it was just you know, such a wonderful thing to, um, to be here to actually dedicate your child to the Lord here today. Um, you... Are blessed. Don't ever forget how blessed you are. You have two children, and it is such a good thing when we bring our children to the Lord. Luke 18, it says here, it says, one day some parents brought their little children to Jesus so we could touch them and bless them. But the disciples told them not to bother them. Then Jesus called for the children and said to the disciples, Let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to such as these. You see, it was customary for a mother to bring their children to the rabbi for a blessing. And that's why these mothers gathered around Jesus that day. The disciples, however, thought that this wasn't too important. He had bigger things to do. But Jesus took the time to dedicate and to bless these children. So Jesus is telling us that children are special. As small as they are, they are special. You see, this child dedication, this is a parental recognition of a solemn responsibility and a trust to raise Noah in the nurture and instruction of the Lord. This provides you a commitment, to a public commitment to God, your friends, and your family. And at the same time, the church body agrees to walk alongside you as parents and hold you accountable. You see, Noah's first glimpse of spiritual community is in your home. So as a parent, you are the first impression of God that Noah gets. It's an awesome responsibility and a privilege. You need to teach Noah the commandments. Deuteronomy 6 says, Write these commandments that I've given you today in your hearts. Get them inside of you and get them inside of your children. Talk about them whenever you're sitting down, you're standing up, you're at home or walking in the street, wherever you are, from morning until night. Tie these commands on their hands and, fore and foreheads as a reminder and inscribe them in the doorposts of your home and on your gates. You see, the Hebrews, they were really extremely successful at making God an integral part of life. 
The reason for their success was that the religious education was life-oriented and not just information-oriented. They used the context of daily life to simply and clearly teach these verses. If you want Noah to follow God, you must make God a part of your everyday experiences as well. You must teach Noah diligently to seek and seek God in all aspects of life, not just those that are church-related. So at this time, I am going to ask you a couple questions. And I'd just like to ask, I'd like you to respond with, we do. Okay? Is it your intention to present your son to the Lord as a gift of God and to give heartfelt thanks for God's blessing? Do you hear this day dedicate Noah to the Lord? Do you hear this day pledge as parents that you will use home, school, church, and every other means available in helping your child learn to love Jesus? Now, congregation, you have a commitment as well. Do you hear this day promise to support these parents through your prayers, church programs, and a nurturing church atmosphere? Please respond, we do. So now, we are going to just, I'm going to pray for your little guy. Hopefully, he keeps on sleeping, <laughs> and I won't make the prayer long, so let me hold him. What a precious boy. Okay. I'm just going to invite you to just close your eyes and bow as we kneel, and we pray over this little boy, Noah. Father in heaven, thank you so much for this day. Thank you for bringing Noah into this world. Lord, he is your child. You know him inside and out. You want to see him in the kingdom, and you've already planned everything out for him. Lord, I just ask that you uh, bless him in a way uh, that only you can. I just ask that as the family raises him, that you will give them knowledge, wisdom, understanding, patience, everything that they will need to make him into a child of God. Here is another little one for the kingdom. And Lord, I just ask that as they go day to day, moment by moment, everything that they do and say will be a reflection of you and help that as the time comes, when he is old enough to make a decision to serve you, that he will do that because he has seen his parents and he's seen his family walk in your way. Thank you so much for this time. And then just be with the family now. We love you so much, Jesus. Amen. All right. I just have one, two things for you. I have a I have a, have a certificate for your dedication. I'll just give that to you. And, then, I, and then, we, then we also have a gift on behalf of our family ministries. Okay? So thank you very much, and God bless you, and have a, have a good Sabbath. Please join with us in our praise time this morning. As you can probably tell by the piano, I'm sure most of you recognize this first one we're going to sing. So let's sing, lift our voices high, and praise the Lord. I'm going to sing, sing, sing. I'm going to shout, shout, shout. I'm going to sing, I'm going to sing. 
Yeah. 
Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Today's scripture reading is going to be taken from John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. I'd like to extend my welcome to you as well. Thank you for coming. Thank you for attending. We're just going to get into the word. Please, please pray with me. Father in heaven, speak through me now. Let everything that comes out of my mouth be straight from you, not anything that I thought of. Let it touch your people. Let it touch me so we can become more like you. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. A mouse looked through a crack in the wall to see the farmer and his wife opening a package. What food might it contain, the mouse thought. He was aghast to discover that it was a mouse trap. So retreating to the farmyard, the mouse proclaimed to all the animals, there's a mouse trap in the house. There's a mouse trap in the house. The chicken clucked and scratched, raised her head and said, Mr. Mouse, 
I can tell you that this is of grave concern to you, but it is of no consequence to me. I can't be bothered. The mouse turned to the pig and told him, there's a mouse trap in the house. I'm so very sorry, Mr. Mouse, sympathized the pig, but there's nothing I can think of to do about it. Surely somebody else will step in and help. The mouse turned to the cow and exclaimed the following, there's a mouse trap in the house. Like, wow, Mr. Mouse, the cow said, a mouse trap and I'm in grave danger? Duh. So the mouse returned to the house, head down and dejected to face the farmer's mouse trap alone. Now that very night, a sound was heard throughout the house, like the sound of a mouse trap catching its prey. So the farmer's wife got up and rushed to see what was caught. In the darkness, she did not see that it was a venomous snake whose tail the trap had caught. The snake bit the farmer's wife. The farmer rushed her to the hospital, but then she returned home with a fever. Now everyone knows that to treat a fever, you use fresh chicken soup. So the farmer took the hatchet down to the farmyard for the soup's main ingredient. His wife's sickness continued so that friends and neighbors came to sit with her around the clock. To feed them, the farmer had to butcher the pig. The farmer's wife was not doing well. In fact, she did not get any better and died. But so many people came to her funeral that the cow had to be slaughtered to provide meat for all of them to eat. So the next time you hear that someone is facing a problem and think it does not concern you, remember that when the least of us is threatened, we are all at risk. You see, ever since sin came into this world, we have been at risk. Because the mouse knew that there was a danger to himself and potentially his other animal friends, he did everything that he could do to warn them. You know, this reminds me of a certain someone who loves us so much that he not only warned us, but he came to save us. The mouse couldn't save them in and of themselves. But Jesus can save us. And he only does that because of his love. What is love, you say? Strong affection for another rising out of kinship or personal ties? Or unselfish, loyal, and benevolent concern for the good of another? You see, as a church, this is the kind of love that needs to be seen in each and every one of us. As I was putting this together, I just thought of the, the old song, and the, the first verse goes like this. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. It's the only thing that there's just too little of. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. No, not just for some, but for everyone. Two things I'd like to cover just very briefly about the love of God. See, one, it's a love which holds nothing back. John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believeth, would not perish, but have everlasting life. He didn't say, just Henderson, right? He, didn't, he said everyone, not just Canadians, not just the North America, not just in Europe or Australia. He said that everyone, he's held back nothing, so all of us can be saved. 
Second thing that comes to mind is it is a totally undeserved love. None of us deserve to be loved, and yet he loves us anyhow by letting his son die on the cross. Romans 5, verses 7 and 8. It reads, Now most people would not be willing to die for an upright person, though some might perhaps be willing to die for a person who is especially good. Isn't that true? But, verse 8, it says, But God showed his great love for, for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. totally undeserved, and he holds nothing back. What an awesome God we have. What awesome love is displayed that he displays to us day after day, moment after moment. This is the love that we need to imitate with each other. You know, when we look at the events of the past week, it's been pretty sickening, hasn't it? It's like we truly don't love one another the way that God does. We have hashtags all over the place, you know, you know black lives matter, all lives matter. The, the fact that we even have to have these hashtags in and of itself is, an, is a problem, isn't it? Why should one people group have their own hashtag because they feel that they're not being cared of? It should be all of us. We're all in this together. But that's why we really need the Lord. We need Jesus to take control of us. See, 1 John 4, verses 7 and 8, it says, Dear friends, let us not continue... Let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God. But anyone who does not, lo does not love does not know God, for God is love. Verses 11 to 17, it also goes on to say, Dear friends, since God loved us that much, we surely ought to love each other. No one has ever seen God, but if we love each other, God lives in us, and his love is brought to full expression in us. And God has given us his spirit as proof that we live in him and he in us. Furthermore, we have seen with our own eyes and now testify that the Father sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. All who declare that Jesus is the Son of God have God living in them, and they live in God. Verse 16, we know how much God loves us, and we have put our trust in his love. God is love, and all who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. And as we live in God, our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid of it on the day of judgment, but we can face him with the confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. How do we tell if we have the love of God? If someone says, I love God, but hates a fellow believer, that person is a liar. Flat out. For if we don't love people, we can see, how can we love God whom we cannot see? And he has given us this command. Those who love God must also love their fellow believers. So if we have the love of God. We have to love everybody else here. It's not optional. We have to. Does God pick and choose who he loves? Does he? I can't hear it. Does, does he pick and choose who he loves? We as humans pick and choose who we love. It's in our nature. You know, I don't like that person or, you know, I, I just won't talk to them. You know, but, you know, this other person, yeah, we get along. We're, we're good, you know. Uh, we, we just mesh together better. But, you know, do I really have to, you know, like 
like them? Do I? I'm sure glad that Jesus doesn't do that to me, you know? Don't really have to like Jonathan? Well, I guess so, you know? That's not how he, that's not how he is. And I'm, I'm so glad that he's not like that, picking and choosing who he loves. How many have skeletons in their closet? <laughs> Some are bold enough to kind of raise their hands, like, where is he going with this? We all have skeletons in our closet. We all have done stuff that we are not proud of. But is Jesus still there for you? Yes. He said, those that come to me, I'm not, there's no way I'm going to cast you out. There's no way. My love is bigger than that. I don't care what you did. Just come to me and I'll fix it up. We may have stuff. And somebody might come to me or I might come to somebody else and say something. What's our response going to be? Are we going to be like Jesus and say, you know what? Let's, let's, t- let's take it to the Lord and let's get this thing fixed up. Or are we going to judge that person and say, whoa, they did that? You did that? Wow. And then all of a sudden on social media, everybody knows your business. Like, that's, that's not how God is. When we love the way that God loves, there are certain things that we will not do because we want to be a reflection of him. It's so important day by day to behold him because by beholding him, we become changed. It's, it's kind of funny. Like We're looking at God. He doesn't change. But there's something when we look at him that we are changed. It's an amazing, it's a miracle. It's a miracle when we as humans accept Christ. And he lays everything out there to make it possible for us to accept him. 1 Corinthians 13. I'll read the first seven verses. It, this is what it says. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels, but didn't love others, I would only be a, a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. Isn't these good attributes to have? Without love? What does he say? I'm nothing. If I give everything I have to the poor and even sacrifice my body, I could boast about it. But, I didn't, but if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Verse 4. This is what love is. This is the crux of it right here. Love is patient and kind. Love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice about injustices, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith. Love is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. That's how you tell if you have the love of God. He makes it really simple. He makes it really simple for us. You can do all the greatest things in the world, but if it doesn't come with that love, it doesn't mean anything. It really doesn't. 
And so I have to check myself. Yeah, I'm up here preaching. Big deal if I don't have any love. My words are nothing. The words I speak out to you would be nothing if, there wasn't any, if it wasn't done with any love. That's very powerful. That is very powerful. Really, before we can truly love each other, we must experience God's love for ourselves. I can't give you love if I don't have it. Christ had all the love. He gave it because he had it. I can't give you something I don't have. I'd love to give you a million bucks. I don't have it. I don't. We need to experience his love for ourselves. And by virtue of that, it will overflow to others. When Christ was here, that's, what, that's all he did. He just said, I want to just show love to everybody. I want to do the Father's will. And just by virtue of that, look at everything that he did. People just came up to him and said, I confess. Like, that's love. That was the very essence of him. That was just out there that people knew. My hope and prayer is that I get to the point one day where I'm so full of love because I've beheld God so much that people just come up to me because of Christ's love. Not because of anything that good that I've done, but it's because of the love that is in me. Can you imagine if we were all filled with that kind of love? Even a little bit. Striving to be like Christ every day? Hanging on his every word? beholding him and just becoming changed just a little bit today and a little bit tomorrow and a little bit the day after? You're not going to go from zero to ten at the same time. You got to go through one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and then eventually you get to ten. You just can't hop over. A little bit at a time by looking at him, looking into his face, and seeing what he has done, and seeing the love that he has for you, and you just, ref just purely reflect that love to each other, to everybody else. You don't become a station of love where it just stays here, but you become a, challenge, a channel of love where it just keeps going out and out and out. Matthew 22, 35 to 39, says, Then one of them, which was a lawyer, asked him, Jesus, a question, tempting him and saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That is all we need to do, brothers and sisters. Love God. And by virtue of loving God, we will have no choice but to love each other. We have no choice. If we're loving God truly, the way that he loves us, we have to love each other because we're just an extension of him. And doesn't he love each and every one of us like we're the only one here in the world? He does. I'm happy to say that he does. And I'm glad that he does. There's no selective love with him. Regardless of where we come from, regardless of our background, regardless of what we've done, 
or the things that we haven't done, he still loves us. There are people sitting in this pew. We have done some things, but he still loves you. I've done stuff. I've sinned and I've come short, but he still loves me. And he loves every single one of us here. What the world really needs and truly needs is love. God has given us his word. God has given us an example that we can follow so that we can show in this sinful world somehow God's glory. Only he can do that. I was reminded of a song as I was looking at the subject of love. And one of the verses goes like this. It says, Because of love he left his throne and made this earth his home. He did it willingly for you and me. With heaven left behind, he came to save all mankind from sin and shame. He could have walked away, but instead he chose to stay upon that tree and take a crown of thorns for me because of love. Because of love, he bore my pain, shouldering the blame. Why did he choose to go? How could he love me so? Because of love, he called to me. He said, child, I will set you free. You'll have life abundantly because of love. He gave unselfishly, caused my blinded eyes to see. It was you and me he had in mind on the road to Calvary. I'd never known such a perfect love. I had fallen down, but he picked me up. He rescued my soul. Now I want the world to know. When God does something for you, you'll truly want other people to know. When God has blessed us and done something, we get so excited, people wonder, what is going on with her? What is going on with him? It's because of just the, the joy and the love that's just flowing out of you. That's what people see. That's what we need today. Amongst all the negativity and all the backlash and everything that's happening in this world today, we can stand tall in love and know that we can make a difference. Jesus came and showed us by living love, by living a life of love and loving others, that you can make a difference. And if he can make a difference, and he's given us the power, the same power that he has, we all can make a difference in this world today. So my challenge to you, and the challenge for me as well, is to behold Jesus in such a way that people will look at him and not me. Let us try and do that this week. Behold him in, in such a way that others will just plainly see Jesus in you. They might not know what it is, but there's something different about you. And be ready to share the gospel with them. Thank you very much. Have a pleasant Sabbath, and God bless. As the gentlemen come up, we are going to just have our closing hymn, and I think it'll be on the screen, Oh, How I Love Jesus. It's number 248. If you would like to follow along in your hymnals, 248.
peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, equip you with every good thing for doing his will. And may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever.